Hello, welcome back. We're on to the third set of lectures now for the geodynamics course, Forces and Stresses. And in this first lecture, we're going to focus on forces, something that's probably already familiar to you. We've got two goals in this lecture. The first is to define what a force is, and after that, we're going to make the distinction between body and surface forces. For our definition, we can simply refer to a force as a push or a pull that's applied to a body. Pretty familiar concept already, classically formulated in Newton's second law as force being equal to mass times acceleration. And so as an example of that, you could think about the mass being the mass of your body, the acceleration being the acceleration due to gravity, and then the force in that case is your weight. The units of force are Newtons, indicated with a capital N here, and one Newton is equal to a kilogram times meters per second squared, and if you do force equals mass in kilograms times acceleration, accelerations are given in meters per second squared, and there you have it. That is one Newton. We represent forces with vectors, and so we're already familiar with vectors from our previous lecture set. And an example of a force that we're all familiar with is gravity, which is a force that's directed toward the center of the Earth, or the center of whatever mass um, has the gravity. So you have an example down here of a force that is indicated with this orange vector F, and in the coordinate system that's shown here, there are two components. So we could consider a component of the force that is acting along the x-axis here, indicated as Fx. And there's another component of that force that's acting in the y direction here, indicated as Fy. So we can split this one force vector into two components, one that's acting in the x direction, the other that's acting in the y direction, and those are just the two parts, the two components of that force vector F. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, we can split these forces into body forces and surface forces, and again, this is something that might be familiar to you on some level, but maybe you've not thought about this uh, in any detail. When we talk about body forces, we're talking about forces that act throughout the volume of a solid. So they're within the entire volume of some object. And they're going to be proportional to that volume or to its mass. So we can think about an example from earth sciences of slab pull. And in the case of slab pull, we have the mass of the oceanic plate that's sinking down into the interior of the earth. And it's being acted upon by gravity that's pulling the entire solid piece of the slab down into the subduction zone. Now in contrast, surface forces are forces that are going to act only upon the surface area bounding an element or a volume, and these are going to then be proportional to the area upon which the force acts. And you'll see when we get to talking about stresses how that dependency on the area becomes important. So an example of this that we might be familiar with, an example of a surface force would be something like friction along a fault plane. So when either side of this massive rock divided by a fault, when either side is moving and there's frictional interactions between the two sides of the fault, that's a surface force. Okay, so now let's take a look at an example of body and surface forces. Here we'll consider a column of rock that's shown here on the figure on the left side out of the Turcotte and Schubert geodynamics textbook as well as the force acting on the basal surface highlighted here in orange at the bottom of this rock column. The column of rock um, is on Earth, so it's subject to gravity. And because of that, the base of this column of rock must support the overlying rock column. So we're basically holding it up with a force on the bottom of this column of rock. If we assume that the column of rock has some nominal thickness, y, and a cross-sectional area of delta A. In that case, all we're saying is that this is just a very small area um, indicated by delta A. We can calculate what the weight of the column is, and it's simply going to be rho g y 
times delta A. So we know that the rho GY, that's our normal way of calculating the, um, the, you know, the, the mass of some uh, piece of rock. Um, it's density times gravity times the thickness will give us that. And then the delta A in this case comes in because the mass of this thing, this mass of rock is being acted upon by body forces, but being supported at its base by uh, along a surface rather, and that surface has an area of delta A, so that's where this delta A comes in here. Now, since we know that the force on the basal surface must be equal to the column weight, we can set those two things equal to one another. So we had seen here that along the base we have this sigma yy times delta A, that's our force acting there, and we know the, the, um, the weight here is rho gy times delta A, so we set those two things equal. The delta A's will cancel out because there's a delta A on both sides, and you're left then with sigma yy equals rho gy. Now, in this case, again, we should just note that sigma yy is acting vertically upward, and that's balancing the downward weight of the column of rock, because in this case, we're assuming that gravity is acting vertically downward along the y-axis. So, there's one thing here that I think bears a little bit of additional thought, and that is we have made an assumption here, and that is that the force on the basal surface must be equal to the column weight. And why is it that we've made that assumption? Why is it that we can say this is true? So go ahead and pause the video, think about this for just a second, and unpause it when you think you've got an idea. Okay, so why is it true that the force on the basal surface must be equal to the column weight. It's true because we're assuming that this column of rock is in an equilibrium state where it's undergoing no accelerations when we balance the two forces. The force of the weight of this column of rock is being balanced by a force at the base of the column of rock. And when we balance those two forces, we assume that there is no acceleration taking place for that column of rock. In other words, it's not free falling down um, into the interior of the Earth. It's static. It's staying in place so that we're able to balance the two forces. If it was falling downward into the Earth, the, we can't do the calculation of the balance of the two forces because we have a column of rock that's undergoing acceleration. All right, so. Let's move on now to the quiz. If you're watching this in Moodle, I've set things up a little bit differently this time, and so as soon as you finish watching the video, you should see a, um, an icon or a button that you can click that's next, and that'll take you right into the quiz questions. And so you'll go through, you do the quiz questions just like you had done before, and at the end of the quiz this way, uh, it, since it's done in Moodle, it'll actually tell you how many questions you got right, how many questions you got wrong. Again, I don't care whether you're right or wrong, I'm not going to keep track of the scores, but you'll get some, um, some score that's reported to you just telling you how many you got right or wrong. All right, so that's it for this, and I'll see you in the next one.